Over the last couple of years on this channel, I've built various expansions for Amiga computers. Most of those have been for the A500. And in fact, you remember a couple of months ago, we had an A500 Plus on the bench that had suffered terrible battery damage. We were able to repair that to get that board up and running again. But at the end of that video, I did say that my whole reason for buying that 500 plus in the first place was to harvest the chipset out of it for an upcoming project. The one thing that has been missing from my collection is a big box Amiga. Ever since back in the day with my A1200 and reading all the various Amiga magazines, the one thing I have always wanted is a big box Amiga. But rather than going out and spending a thousand pounds on an original, well, browsing eBay one day, I stumbled across a listing for this board sitting here beside me. Now granted, this didn't come from eBay, but I did see one of these for sale there. Uh, this is an Amiga 2000, or more accurately, an EATX. Amiga 2000. So what does that mean? Well, this is an open source project from GitHub, whereby a user of the name of Jason's Beer has recreated the Amiga 2000 motherboard, but changed the form factor of it to an EATX form. A bunch of us from Discord got together, ordered the PCB and all the parts, and I think it's finally about time that I put mine together. So these boards came from JLC PCB. Other manufacturers are available and just to put it on record this is not a sponsored video, not in any way. My um, board has a bit of a warp in it. In fact all five boards that were ordered all came with a bit of a warp but some of the other guys have theirs built already and have them working. So that's a good thing, because at least I know there's no manufacturing defects within the board itself. As you can tell, several of the components are already fitted. We got JLC to fit whatever they could, but despite that, there still is an awful lot left to do. I'm gonna start with all the surface mount stuff, and I suppose we may work our way through this incredible amount of capacitors. Well, these things certainly look tricky enough because each one of them has four pods. The two main pods either side for your pass through of your pass through capacitor and the two either side are ground. I might have to put a slightly smaller tip in the iron, but let's see how we get on. So there's the first two of them there. Let's put those two into those two positions. They don't seem to have a top side, so I think they can go on you know, either way. Let's just get it done, shall we? So plenty of flux. And it seems of the three guys who have built their boards already, just chatting to them this morning, um, all three of them put these on slightly differently. I'm going to try and do it just my typical way. So we'll put a bit of solder onto one pod. Grab the component in the tweezers, remelt that solder and offer this up. Right, that's not too bad. Then try and do the other side. Now doing these middle bits, well the outside one here is easy enough. As is that one there. But what about that bit in the middle? I suppose it doesn't really matter if we bridge it because that's just a ground running right down there. But I would prefer not to if I could get away with it. So let's see how this goes. That one seems to be on okay. And yeah, that's actually not too bad. Just let me tidy that up just quickly with a cotton bud. 
and get a better look at how we've got on here. And to be perfectly honest with you, I am more than happy with that. There's maybe a little bit too much solder just on that side there, where I first tacked it down. But I don't think it's anything worth worrying about. So that is the first two done. But as you can see, there is quite a few yet to do. Okay, they're all on. There's a few more in other positions about the board as well. But while they may be stuck to the board, some of them aren't exactly the straightest. I did my best with uh, the tweezers, but what I want to do quickly is just hit them with a bit of hot air. And the theory being that the solder should melt again, and just the air speed alone, along with the solder oh, that's already on there, should just pull everything in nicely. Seen one move there, perhaps. And don't worry about the <laughs> mountain of smoke coming off of this. That's just the flux that is on there, just burning off. Yeah, that looks a bit better now. I'm just going to give it all a bit of a quick clean with cotton buds and IPA. And then just going to very quickly check with the multimeter for any shorts. It's only been roughly cleaned, but that is enough for now. I'm going to try and get the whole board professionally cleaned when we're finished. But I want to test what I've done so far, just to make sure there's no shorts. Meter is in continuity. Now, each one of these things does test as a short, like that. So really, all I'm checking for here is that we have nothing shorted between ground, which runs up the middle of them and the signal passing through. That's fine. Yeah, I think that's good. But we have barely even scratched the surface of what needs to go on here. There is quite a bit more of this very small stuff. Various other resistors, capacitors and ferrite beads that need to be fitted. So I think I'll get on and just do all of that. And I should have said this earlier, but the board, all the components, the way this was beautifully laid out and labelled, just to make my life so much easier. Same with all the through hole stuff, which I've just put in this bag to keep it out of the way for now. But all of this was put together by Sparks UK. So thank you very much, Sparks. He undertook the job of ordering the PCBs getting JLC to fit what they could here, ordering all the parts and separating it all out like this for the five of us that ordered the boards. So thanks very much Sparks for all your effort. Let's just get on and put the rest of this together. Now given just how thin that bit is, it has sort of sat up off the board on me. So I'll just rest the tweezers on top of it, heat this again and it should snap down into position. There we are. Thought I'd concentrate on the bottom side of the board because there isn't that much down here. I'm just doing this area here around where the ATX power connector will eventually go. Thought I was finished. Well, obviously the two 7474s need to go on, but we're doing all the ICs later. For now I'm just going to do all the chicken feed, as it's called. And then I spotted these two solder pads here. Initially I thought there is no way those could be solder pads, because that is the size of nothing. But no, that is component D9100, and we do indeed have D9100 included, so... Let's see if we can put this on. Those are the smallest solder pads I have ever seen. So there is the absolutely tiny component. But we'll just try the same procedure again. And let's see if I can keep my hand steady enough for long enough to try and get this tacked down in position. 
I actually think I'll be better trying to do it with my left hand and try to operate the iron with my right hand instead. I think I'm going to have to get the magnification light to get a better look at that. So apologies for the blurry image, but yes, that does appear to be on correctly. And just for some context, you can see the full length of the board there, and that is that incredibly tiny component. Right, there's just a couple more bits of the chicken feed, as I called it, on the bottom here, yet to do. So I'll do that, and then we'll come back and take a look at these two. Future CRG here, and that component you just seen me fit, that's actually a diode. Now I call it dumb luck, if you will, but it just so happens that I put it on in the correct orientation. But on the silk screen on the board, the component is represented by that sort of shape there, like an elongated C. The component itself, if you look at it under magnification, there is a line at one end of it. It has to be fitted with the line on the end of the component matching up with the closed end of the symbol. And luckily enough, that's the way I just happened to do it. So bear that in mind, if you're ever trying to fit those things, that's the way they need to go on. Back to the video. Well, we've got just a slight problem. I seem to have misplaced those two. I've been over everything that was sent. And I am 100% confident that they were included. But typical me, I seem to have lost them. So I'll just leave them for now and we'll flip the board over and continue assembling everything on the other side. Then hopefully by the time we've finished all that, there'll be two components left over and it'll be those. Okay, back on the top side of the board and to finish off this sort of area here where we had been working, let's fit these two components here, U304 and U305. So we'll do 304 first. Pin 1 is up here where the dot is. And on the package itself there's a solid line at the top of it there. Pin 1 is that top left hand corner. So I'm going to try and do this a little bit different. We have a flux just where pin 1 is. I'm going to tin up the iron and then we'll just try and hold this in place while tacking down that one pin. Okay, that looks pretty good. It's positioned nicely on the pads. So let me see if I can get the opposite corner down. Try not to burn my finger in the process. Right, that's a bit better. Opposite corners are now tacked down. So we can just go in with a load of flux. And we can just get the rest of it done. So while there may not be too much more on this page to fit, there still is an absolute mountain of other stuff. All the through hole stuff, all these surface mount capacitors. I think it's about time for a soldering montage. U502 and U504. This time we still have the dot on the silk screen but on the chip. There's no line, rather pin 1 is denoted by a dot on this as well.
This bit is a wee bit more tricky. This is our SRAM. This will essentially become our two megabytes of chip memory. And what makes this that wee bit trickier is the fact that the pitch on these is considerably smaller than everything else we have done so far. But it is just the same principle again. Plenty of flux, line it up, we'll try and tack down just one corner. That's not too bad there. Let me see if I can try and get one up this corner down as well. Bit of a blob there, but that's fine. I can sort that out in a minute. Truth told, I shouldn't have put all that flux on that because it's making it really hard to see if it is aligned correctly or not. So yeah, it does actually look okay. So let's put that flux back on. And we can just go for it. Let's try and get it soldered in. So we're almost done with the surface mount stuff. Still an awful lot of these type of capacitors to fit. I've no idea why JLC just fitted the one capacitor for us. It's a 47 UF. Well, there's plenty of other 47s on the board that they run out or something. They still have to fit the crystal. And you do have two options on this board, either X1 or X2. X1 being your more traditional through hole larger footprint part and X2 being this incredibly small part. Despite the fact that I have this here, I may actually just fit the uh, through hole part. I can pull one of those crystals off that spur A500 plus motherboard that we're going to be stripping the chipset from. And the reason I say that is those solder pods there are big enough, but the solder points on this component, I can hardly see them. They're on the sides there, but they're absolutely tiny and I'd be worried about not getting enough solder onto that and not making good enough contact. I'll have a think about that though, while I put on lots of capacitors. Or in fact, just before we do capacitors, let's tackle this, which is a 5 volt voltage regulator. But it's not just enough to tack down those two legs. We also need to try and get the metal back of it secured to the PCV. That will be the ground. And I may need to turn the heat up on the iron slightly for this because this is a massive big section here I'm trying to get this onto. Yep, not enough heat. Let's see if this works down instead. Yeah, that'll do nicely. I took the heat up to 400 there just to do that. But we'll bring it back down now and start into all these capacitors. So I'm not going to record too many of these. As I'm sure you've seen me doing loads of these last week when we recapped that A1200. But I'm just going to do it the same way. So I'll just turn up the pod. These capacitors are so big I don't really need my tweezers. I can just use my fingers. I'll just melt that again and push that into position. One down, many more to go. All of the surface mount work is done. Well, apart from that oscillator. X2, the solder points on that are so ridiculously small. I honestly don't think I'll be able to make good contact with uh, my iron, with my setup. But look, it's only right that we at least give it a go. A bit of hot air might do the trick getting it into place. And sure, if it doesn't work, a bit of hot air will always take it off and we can always just fit the through hole oscillator. So let's see if we can get this on. So you can just about make out the solder points on the side of this. There's four of them there on each side, two per pod. 
this is going to be incredibly difficult because the actual package itself is more or less the same size as the spot it has to go. So I think what we'll do here is we've got a bit of flux on. We'll just turn up all four pads and I think it's going to have to be hot air, you know, to get that down. I'll try it with the iron first, but ultimately I think it's going to have to be the hot air. Just go for a bit more flux. The orientation of this, you can see the dot there. That goes up to this corner here. So I think that side's down okay. And yeah, the other side looks to be as well. So let me turn the board around. Yeah, that looks okay. I think that has worked. Now, of course, using the oscillator at this point, that's a 3.3 volt part. And one of the guys from our group that has built this already, Pollock, he discovered that we need to make a slight modification on the board to uh, make this work. We'll need to do that when fitting the ATX power connector. And you know what? Since all the surface mount stuff is done, I'm just going to give the board a very quick clean around all the points I've been working. And then we'll get on to the through hole stuff. And the first thing we'll do is that ATX power connector. It's not spotless, but it'll certainly do for now. So let's put on the ATX connector. You can see the outline of it here with a notch at the top there. That represents the notch on this where the bracket of the power connector would go over. So that's going in that way. And I'm just going to use a couple of bits of blue tack to hold it in place. Then we can flip the board over and solder in the pins. Just the opposite corners first of all. Then we can flip the board over, remove our blue tack, and just check that this is indeed sitting flush, which it seems to be. So back to the other side and just get all the rest of this soldered down. So what is this fix I am talking about? Well, firstly, this is a 24 pin connector and the fix only applies if you want to use a 20 pin ATX power connector. But say that was the case. Remember our oscillator down here? Well, this thing runs at 3.3 volts. On the 24 pin ATX connector here, we just bring up the pin out of it. Pin 12, this one down here. Future CRG again, and it's pretty obvious that the point from which I'm testing there, that isn't pin 12. In fact, that is pin 24. So there's not much point in showing you this brief sequence here, but suffice to say, the issue with the 3.3 volt is that the oscillator is powered from pin 12. But if you were using a 20 pin connector, well, that bottom four there, they would not be populated. And so there'd be no power going to your oscillator. What you need to do is run a patch wire from pin one, two or 13. We take it from pin one and take that down to pin 12. What you're about to see on the bottom of the board, that is correct. That is the position in which the patch wire needs to be installed. 3.3 volt is traditionally orange. So let's use a bit of orange wire. And that's us ready to use either a 20 or 24 pin power supply. I do have a spur power supply lined up for this board. I just can't remember if it's 20 or 24 pin. But doing that we fix doesn't do you any harm, even if you're using the 24 pin. So it's just all the through hole stuff to do. Well, apart from those two, they're labeled on the board here as 74HCT245s. And I do have two more of them that were originally to go there. But again, one of our guys, and I think it was Sparks UK this time, he was having problems getting the board to work. And we discovered that those two components instead of being 74HCT245s, should be 74F245s. The HCT part was causing timing problems with the board. 
So the eighth variant of it is in the post on the way to me. Should be here tomorrow. But just to anticipate the arrival of that, let's get all the sockets on, all the ports on. There are various resistor packs that I need to fit. Q soldering montage number two. Just before we put the sockets on, there are various pin headers that we need to populate as well. There's one there, for example, a six-way header. So that'll just go in there like that. I'm just gonna put this jumper in the middle of it, when we're actually using this. This is for the tick header, but when we're actually using this on the board, the jumper will go in the positions one and two. But just putting that in the middle there, so that I can stick the blue tack to it centrally and that should hopefully hold it nice and straight. Yeah, that looks fine. May as well move that into the correct position now. And then I'll just do the rest. Time for sockets. Ooh, it's getting close. And let's start with the fat lady, Agnes. Let's get her socket on. So pin one on this is the middle of that side. On the socket itself is an arrow that's pointing towards pin one. It needs to go on like that. Slowly but surely, it's coming together, isn't it? I have one more socket to fit for the CPU. I was thinking of using a turned pin socket at this point, but as well as the chipset that we need to recover off the old 500 plus board, I also need the video hybrid to go in there. That's this thing. And perhaps while I'm desoldering that, Maybe we should just take the CPU socket off this as well. And you know what? The other thing that I'm going to need off this board is the floppy header. To put that on there. Okay, we've got the hybrid, which goes in here, like that. We've got our floppy header, which goes in there. But as for the CPU socket, there's the one I removed and um, it's a little bit rough. You can tell it's been used. It's got scratches and things on it from where a CPU you know, has been in and out over time. People have been jamming screwdrivers in or these things in, chip lifters. It's just marked the plastic. So I'm still of two minds to just use the turned socket. There's nothing wrong with this. It's just it does look a bit used and everything else here more or less is new so I think I'm just going to go with this and that goes in there like that and then it's just the ports on the back so starting over here keyboard connector uses an A2000 style keyboard 
So that's another thing we'll have to source. The DB9 for the joysticks. They're not side by side on this board, rather they're stacked. Equally, DB25s for parallel and serial. They're stacked. Oops. Audio, well, that's applied through a three and a half mil jack. And finally, video, that comes through the VGA connector. Now, despite that being a VGA port, this is still just a 15 kilohertz signal coming out of here. That's your standard Amiga signal. So I'll have to make up a cable to go from that to SCART so we can try and get a picture out of this. Okay, last piece of the puzzle pie. Our two 74F254s. I have to go on there in that orientation. So let's get them on. We have a couple of quick tests that I want to do. Then we're going to put some power through it. Then we'll finally populate the chipset. I am super excited to know if this is going to work. So let's just get this done. So just before we start throwing any power at this, let's very quickly just check for shorts on the various voltage rails. Now, truth told, I have already had a quick look and I was extremely worried because I was finding shorts all over the place while using that 24 pin ATX diagram that I showed you earlier. Of course, said diagram is looking at it from the other direction. So once I figured that out and flipped it accordingly, well, there doesn't appear to be any issues. So no short between the 3.3 volt and ground. Equally, nothing shorted on the 12 volt rail. 5 volt rail is reading about 200 ohms to ground, which is fine. Nothing on the negative 12 volt. What about between the voltage rails? I haven't checked that right enough. So between 3.3 volt and 12, that's fine. Between 3.3 and 5, that's fine. So next thing to do, let's hook up some power. I'm gonna add this old hard drive to the power supply here just to act as a bit of load. But let's hit the power switch. That red light there hopefully will light up and we can test for some voltages around the board. Well, no explosions. That's always a positive. So let's just take one of the 74 series logic. Let's test between 5 volts and ground. And 4.8 odd. It's fluctuating a bit there. That's looking good. Power supplies came up a bit, up to 5 volts. Just let me check that again over here. That's still a bit lower up this end of the board. I wonder why that is. What about on one of the CIA chips? Ground is on pin 1. And VCC should be on pin 20. Yep, that's looking good again. So it's time to put it to the test. Populate the sockets. But of course, I need to get a video signal, don't I? I need to make a cable for that first. Alright, the cable is ready to go. Haven't hooked up audio at this stage, just want to see if we get a video signal. But I'm not actually sure if this cable will work. The RGB signals are just passed straight through to the SCART connector. For sync, there is an option on the board over here. You can pick either horizontal or composite sync. So I've got it onto composite sync. And it's just really a matter now of continuing to populate the sockets. You can see I've got the two CIAs and Gary in there. So what about Paula? Denise. I'll just take the ROM off this board. My plans for this eventually is to go to kickstart 3.2.1 but for now we'll just go with uh, 
version 2.04. I'll have to get my PLCC extractor out of the drawer to get Agnes out. For the CPU though, well, I have something a little special in mind for that. Yes, we could just use any 68,000 chip, but rather I've been saving this one for a special occasion. A ceramic 68,000. I don't think there's any occasion more special than this, so that will go in there. And it's just dawned on me, I forgot to set the jumpers on the board. So let me get Agnes out of here, into there. And then there are various solder jumpers that we need to set on the board, which define which Agnes we are using. There are various jumpers that we need to set. There's a handy wee table here on the back of the board, but I'll throw up a copy of this from the GitHub just so it's easier to read. Our Agnes is an 8375 and it's a part number 390544-01. So it is this column here that we need to follow. Then there's actually one more, although it's not labelled in that list. It sits over here beside Gary. Jumper 900. Enable chip RAM slowdown during DMA normally shorted. So normally shorted, let's just short it. I'm sure if that is meant to be any different, we can always come back and change it later. Right, let's see what it does. Video cables hooked up even connected a floppy drive, feeling confident you might say. And just as well I checked, because Paula, Denise and Gary, I had in their sockets the wrong way around. Not that I think it would damage the chips, but nevertheless, good to check it. So, power on. And no video signal, nothing whatsoever. So we know we have power, but what's the other two things we need for a working computer? We need a reset signal and we need a clock. So let's check those two. On the 68K CPU, reset is on pin 18, clock is on pin 15. Right, we're on pin 18 there, reset. So let's see if that is working. And yes, it does seem to be. Starts up low and then a couple of milliseconds later, goes high. Clock is on pin 15, so let's move back down to that. 18, 17, 16, 15. And there's no clock. So it seems Agnes is not getting her clock, and that is derived through U109. There is a clock coming out of our crystal here, okay. In fact, let me switch things on to show you. So we've got a clock there, okay. But if I go test up at this point up here, you can see that that is just low. But that should be a 28 megahertz clock and that is feeding into Agnes. And then it's the fat lady that divides all that down giving us, for example, our seven megahertz clock to the CPU. So having a quick chat with the guys in Discord and Pillock, the guy who uh, came up with the fix for the power connector, well, he pointed me towards a comment on the GitHub, which says that pin one of this, if that is found to be floating, which it is in my case, well, that is a signal X C L K E N, external clock enable, perhaps. And with that floating like that, it seems that U109 here will not pass the 28 megahertz signal through to Alice. So the fix for that is to fit 10k pull-up to pin 1. Okay, so 10k pull-up is in place. Let's try this again. So power on. Do we have a clock here going down to Agnes? Oh, we do. We do. What about at the CPU? Any activity on pin 15? Yes. We have a clock. Is it running? 
Let's hook up the display quickly and find out. Right, here we go. Let's try it again. Video signal. Grey screen. Stuck on a grey screen. Come on, do something. Not looking promising, is it? And the screen's gone black, no signal. Well, it's a few days later. We have made progress. We've got some good news and we've got some bad news. And I'm very conscious that you've now been watching this video for about 42 minutes. So I'm not going to force you to sit and watch all the testing I've done. But just to talk you through it quickly. I thought the video signal that we had coming out of here looked a bit flaky going through to the SCART. So I've done away with that. Connected everything up to one of these. The old GBS 8200 scan doubler. And using that, I got a green screen. Now, on Amiga, we know green screen, that's got to be the chip RAM. So, our SRAM module, reflowed that, reflowed all of this stuff associated with it, but no difference. Probing around the CPU, I noticed that the data bus itself looked a bit flaky. It was pulsing very slowly. Um, normally held low, you know, it wasn't pulsing low high, low high, it was just low. So reflowed everything that was sitting on that, but no difference. So I thought it unlikely that any of the new components would be bad. What's left? Our chipset. So the chipset that is now on this board, this is one out of my other A500 Plus. That's the A500 that I have the Pi Storm in. And with all that in here now, if I throw the power switch, well, we now have one working Amiga. So the good news is that the board works. Although granted, I haven't tested it beyond that kickstart screen. We'll attach a floppy drive in a minute and run Amiga test kit. The bad news though, is that one of the customs out of the other chipset, it has failed. And unfortunately, it's Agnes. Now, I haven't totally given up on it yet. If you remember the A500 Plus that we took the other chipset out of, well, it had suffered really bad corrosion. And I know the guy that I got it off, he had cleaned the Agnes chip, although we did clean it ourselves a bit more when repairing that board. So there's always the possibility that it just needs some further cleaning. Or perhaps one of the legs is a bit flaky on it and we'd have to grind back the surface of it to try and make something good. Maybe the corrosion has got internal and caused a break in there. But that's for another time. For now though, this board works. It's got its A500 Plus chipset on it. So let's test it a bit further by hooking up the floppy drive and running Amiga test kit. Now, I haven't yet sourced a keyboard for this. In fact, what I'm probably going to do is just take an A500 keyboard. I'll try and make a case for it or force it into an old PC keyboard case or something like that. Then we can very easily modify the A500 keyboard to work in there. So for now, instead, I'm just going to use a mouse. We can navigate Amiga Test Kit with the mouse fine. Granted, I'm not actually sure which one of these two is the mouse port, so let's just start with the bottom one, shall we? Okay, I can hear the disk drive clicking. Let's put the disk in and see if it boots. Yep, all good so far. Does our mouse work? Yep, does indeed. Memory? It has detected our two megabytes total chip. So that's good. Let's run a quick memory test. Well, I say quick memory test, but because we're only on the 68K processor, this might actually take a while. Okay, it's been round fully twice and no errors. Happy enough with that. Have a look at the video signal. That looks fine. Let me hook up some speakers and we can try the audio test.
Yeah, that's all good. Low pass filter. Yep. You might be able to hear it through the microphone, but I can hear it's working fine. A little Adrian's digital basement inspired dancing there. So certainly all seems good anyway. Granted that was the most basic of basic tests, but I am more than happy that our A2000 EATX, well, it all seems to be working. Granted though, at the minute, it is essentially just a glorified Amiga 500 Plus because while it does have that whole chipset in there, it is missing the one thing that I suppose makes it an Amiga 2000, and that would be Buster, who lives in here. Now you might see that I have a little jumper link in here. That's between pins 46 and 48. I was advised to do that by Liv2, one of the other guys on Discord. I was putting that jumper link in there, disabled the Zorro side of things on this board. Now getting a buster, a genuine chip anyway, that would be kind of difficult. But the one thing we do have is this. The bluster created by Live2 actually. And this is a modern replacement for buster. But we're not going to do that today. Rather I think I'll leave the building of this, the installation of the Zaro slots, the ISA slots, the video slot, and the CPU slot. We'll leave them till next time. So yeah, I think that is more than enough for today. This video is currently rolling up on 50 minutes long. If you're still watching at this stage, thank you very much for sticking with it. The board's built, it's working. We still have to do the Zaro stuff, so we will do that next time. But, a couple of things. At the start of this video, I said that once this is fully built, I want to get it professionally cleaned. Here's the thing though. Does anyone know of anywhere in the round Belfast that I could get this professionally cleaned? It will need a really big ultrasonic cleaner to fit an EATX motherboard. So I will have a look to see if there's any companies about that could maybe do it for me. But if anyone watching this knows of any companies locally that would be able to do it, please get in touch, let me know. And then the other thing that we need to have a think about is what case am I going to put this into? Now I have an idea in my own head of what sort of case, what sort of setup to put this into. But I would be interested to hear what you think. Should it go into a traditional beige box? I'm not so keen on that idea myself. I would like to put it into something slightly more modern. Something with a window on the side of it so I can admire all my hard work here. But I suppose the question is, should it go into a fairly plain, modern looking case? Or should I go crazy, full RGB gamer mode on this? And build it into a case that looks a little bit over the top? To be perfectly honest, I'm sort of torn between the two. I don't really know, but we'd be interested to hear your thoughts. So that is it for today. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Why not hit subscribe if you haven't done so already? Still plenty more yet to come here on CRG, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>